Hey there. I uh, hope everyone's doing okay this week. Um, last week we talked about simple part forms. Um, simple binary, rounded binary, and ternary, and how those are formed from periods and phrase groups. Um, and hopefully you recognize some of the pieces or songs in your repertoire that might fit those molds. In particular, the uh, rounded binary or ternary, where entire parts reoccur. That is, they return after a departure to other motivic or harmonic material. Um, the simple ternary that we've discussed so far has a very specific definition, but we can also talk more broadly about ternary division as a principle of form. Uh, in a lot of your music, you might have noticed some kind of loose ABA form at various levels from phrases to even to entire movements. Um, you know, that is, there's some kind of statement and then a contrasting or complementing statement and then a recurrence of the first statement. You see this in music all the time because it's an arrangement that at once promotes unity and variety of abstract musical ideas. That is, it feels cohesive, uh, but it doesn't get boring. And from the perspective of the listener, uh, recurrence of material that you've heard before is a lot like uh, is a lot like going on a journey or going on vacation, right? You you go on vacation, uh, you experience <laughs> wherever you went on vacation, and you return hopefully with a better perspective on life or travel or people. And I think you get the same kind of effect uh, in music in that when your, say, your A section returns, depending on what happened in the B section in your, <laughs> in its vacation, uh, you know, you get a new perspective on that A section, which, which can be um, really enlightening. Just be careful when you talk about the ternary principle in a general sense, not to confuse that with the very specific definition that we have for a simple ternary form. For instance, this example, uh, is uh, by Mozart. First, uh, the first 24 measures here are in ternary form. Uh, we have eight bars uh, ending in a perfect authentic cadence. Uh, measures 9 through 16. Uh, we really have a sentence structure here ending on a on a half cadence there in measure 16. And then there in measure 17 we get our return our recurrence of the first eight bars uh, verbatim, again, ending in a perfect authentic cadence. Um, <clears throat> and so, as we know, since we have a full return of the A section, this would be a ternary form. Uh, and since our B section ended on a half cadence, this would be a simple, continuous ternary. So you might have noticed that uh, we've been talking about simple part forms. Uh, simple binary, simple ternary. And that's because we're now going to look at compound ternary. So a compound ternary is an enlarged three-part form. So we've seen how uh, periods and phrase groups combine to make simple binary and simple ternary. Um, most of the examples we've looked at have been smaller movements uh, or portions of larger works. Uh, and in these larger works, the form we identified, whether it be binary, ternary, was often only part of a larger whole. So very simply, uh, a compound ternary form will be composed of three simple part forms, uh, either simple binary, simple ternary. Uh, each of these larger parts are represented by a capital letter with a square around it. It's very important to distinguish between capital letter which represents one part of our simple part forms, and a squared capital letter, which represents an entire binary or ternary part of our compound uh, ternary form. So let's look back at the Mozart piece that we looked at before, because we just looked at part of it. Um, so this is the entire movement. Um, and let's let's listen to this whole thing.
So we already talked about the first a uh, that it was a that it was in a simple ternary form, and how we got a ternary form out of that. That should be pre pretty clear at this point. Um, but now we'll look at down at the trio. Uh, you might notice that the key has changed, uh, and this is very common for a minuet and trio or a scherzo and trio for the trio part to explore the subdominant key area or to be in the subdominant key. Uh, and this is in fact what Mozart Mozart does here, he explores G major. So we can look at the trio in the same way that we looked at um, the minuet part of, part of this. Here in the trio from measure 25 to 32, uh, we have a parallel period ending in a perfect authentic cadence. We see that a lot. For measure 33 to 40, uh, we've got um, we've got a phrase group ending in a half cadence uh, there in measure 40. Uh, and then 41, the simple A section returns. Uh, he changes the um, instrumentation a little bit, but that's A material there. So we call that A prime. Now, I want to point your attention to something very important. This, as we said, this was the entire movement. But if you look down in the right hand corner, uh, where it says minuetto de capo, meaning to play the minuet. And customarily, you would play the minuet again, often without repeats. We mentioned whenever we see a repeat sign that that doesn't factor into our form. Uh, but that was because that was a reiteration type of repeat, meaning it, it repeated immediately. Uh, what we're looking at now is a recurring uh, type of repetition where that minuet is played after the trio. And so we have a recurrence here. And so that does factor into the form. And so when you factor in the fact that the minuet is played again, we have a large a, we have a ternary form making our squared A, and then we have another ternary form creating our squared B, and then of course we play the squared A section again. Uh, and that leaves us with a compound ternary, meaning a ternary form made of ternary forms. This is a very simple example. Um, so let's look at a different example. And I want to look at a, a little bit more complicated example. So the Mozart is a pretty straightforward example of a compound ternary. Uh, so I'd like to turn our attention to something a little bit more elaborate. This is the second movement of Beethoven's uh, Opus 26 piano sonata. Uh, and as you can see, it's a scherzo in trio, uh, the minuet in trio and the scherzo in trio. Um, are very similar in construction. Uh, both are light movements in character. Um, the scherzo is kind of uh, more of a musical joke, specifically a, a joke. Uh, and we'll definitely see Beethoven's sense of humor in this piece here. So let's listen to that. Thank you. 
So, uh, interesting piece, right? Uh, if you were like me when the first time I heard this, it kind of took me a second to get my bearings as far as uh, where what the tonic was uh, and where it was happening. Um, uh, the first four measures start in the wrong key. Uh, this piece is in the key of A flat, but despite starting the first note technically is A flat there in the uh, pickup to measure one, but the first four measures are in E flat, and there's actually a perfect authentic cadence in measure four in E flat. So in the first four bars, there is what is effectively a perfect authentic cadence in measure four. It's just that it's in the key of E flat. Uh, when we hear the next phrase uh, from five through eight, it's uh, in the key of A flat. It's in the right key. Um, <clears throat> of course, this is followed up with another uh, phrase from nine through 12 in, in the wrong key again. And then, of course, he ends this up in the right key. So in these first 16 bars, it's kind of hard to tell what key we're in. And so knowing that, how do we how do we know? What, how do we determine what to call this, what to call these 16 bars? So I'm calling this a sequential period uh, for two reasons. Sequential, be, number one, because the melodic material, it repeats at a different pitch level, as a sequential period does. Um, now, on your first listen, you might hear a perfect authentic cadence in measure four, and then another perfect authentic cadence in measure eight. Uh, it is kind of hard to justify a half cadence on the first listen. But on the repeat of this section, we're kind of in on the joke at that point. And so it would be fair to call this a, a half cadence with maybe a little asterisk. Um, so first 16 bars, we've got a sequential period and then a sequential period with a modified repetition. So a sequential period with a modified repetition comprises the first part of our A section here, uh, of our larger A. Starting at measure 17, he continues with A flat, uh, except A flat here isn't a, a tonic, it's a dominant. And, you know, he moves up a pitch level to B flat as a dominant. So we have what is effectively A flat to A flat seven, moving to a B flat to a B flat seven. Uh, and then in measure 25, we end up with a C seven. So I call this a phrase group since there's no conclusive ending on any one of these phrases and he doesn't intend to conclude it here anyway as we can see uh, once he gets to measure 29 <laughs> we start this uh, comically long expansion of the dominant that lasts all the way until measure 44 uh, and the dominant of what here in this case he's using the dominant of F minor uh, you might ask why the dominant of F minor if this is in the key of A flat. Well, we're not coming back to A flat. We're coming back to the two chord of E flat, which is how we started in measure one, which is F minor. And that's what he does there in measure 45. <clears throat> and so measure 45 is the return of our A. It doesn't look like it on the page, uh, but if you notice, in the uh, lower part, there's the main motivic material. And again, here, in these first four bars, despite the notes going on above it, uh, we're in the key of E flat again, momentarily anyway, uh, before moving on to the correct key of A flat. So this return of A is a full return of A along with this contrapuntal material, uh, the eighth notes that he's using. Uh, now, at the end of this, we have an imperfect authentic cadence there in measure 60. And it isn't until measure 61 to 67, the uh, codetta here, that we're kind of let in 
on the joke that we really are in the key of A flat major. The perfect authentic cadence in measure 67 kind of confirms this. So just like we'd expect, the trio starts in the trio or the the compound B section uh, starts in measure 68. Uh, and as we'd expect, uh, it's in the subdominant here in uh, D flat. Measures 68 to 96, we just have a phrase there. It goes by pretty quick. It's just a phrase that repeats. It ends in a half cadence, and so there we would just call this a phrase ending in a half cadence. There's not a lot to it. But uh, starting in measure 76, this would be the B section of our B section. The phrase previously was just the A section of our compound B section. Um, but here in measure uh, 76, that's the B section of our B section. Uh, and in my analysis, I s called this a contrasting period. It might not look at all like a contrasting period, but uh, if we if we compare this piece to itself, uh, and we look at the contrapuntal lines in the soprano and the bass, we can see a rising idea from the C in measure 70, rising all the way to measure 83. And in measure 83, you could make an argument for an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of G flat. Here's Beethoven exploring the four of the four <laughs> of A flat, which is G flat. And at that point, it could be said that the uh, ascending scalar light pattern sort of uh, waffles and then collapses into a cadence in the key of D flat in measure 91. Now this could also be called a, a phrase group just depending on how uh, you want to look at it. So in measure 92 we have a retransition back to the big A section at the beginning. Uh, and if you notice there at the bottom he indicates uh, scherzo de capo senza repetition. I hope I said that alright. Uh, but basically there he wants you to go back to the head just like the just like the Mozart did it said repeat the A section again and so like the Mozart this is a recurring repetition of that A section and so we do count this in the form and so at this point we would hear the whole A section again but without repeats cuz we've heard all of this before. Uh, okay, so our A section is very clearly a, a simple continuous ternary, right? We had 16 bars in our A section from measures 1 through 16, <clears throat> and then if we look at the repetition of the A section starting at measure 45, we again have 16 bars plus a codetta. So there's a full uh, a section here, so we can call this a ternary. Uh, <clears throat> now, in at the end of our B section, at, at the end of this really long dominant expansion in measure 44, we would call that a half cadence, and so this would just be continuous. So we have a simple continuous ternary from measures 1 through 67. Now, our trio is going to be a simple binary, right? Our A section was just the first eight bars here for measure 68 to 96. Uh, and then our B section is the what we called a contrasting period for measure 76 to 95. So given that our A section was a simple continuous ternary, our B section was just a simple binary. And then of course, given the repetition of our A section is just a simple continuous ternary. This is a compound ternary form, the entire movement here. Uh, do keep in mind that composers don't always use repeat signs, and they don't always use the uh, de capo indication to, to indicate a repetition. Sometimes the repetitions are fully written out. So it's important not to rely on 
the either the Decapo indications or just the repeat bars to to tell you that hey, you know here's this A section or here this B section. Uh, there can be compound ternary forms that don't indicate minuet and trio or scherzo and trio. Um, so do watch out for that.